Hi there. I'm so excited to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, you might know her as the Vice President of the United States on Scandal or Dr. Ellis Gray on Grey's Anatomy. She's also a five-time Tony nominee. Three. Three? <laughs> Three-time Tony nominee. Oh my gosh. Three-time Emmy nominee. So that kind of is the same amount. Wow. Uh, well, I'm starting <laughs> off strong today. Um, well, congratulations on your three Tony <laughs> nominations. Um, and let's talk about your latest project. Right. This is an immersive theatrical production called The Dead 1904. Mm -hmm. It's based on a James Joyce short story, a novella mm -hmm. from his collection Dubliners. Mm -hmm. And it is unlike any other theatrical production I have ever seen mm -hmm. slash been part of. Uh, <laughs> as an audience member... I was all up in this production. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the story and the way that it's set up and staged? Absolutely. Um, well, so The Dead is, as you say, from a collection of uh, short stories, hello there, Jean, uh, by, um, by James Joyce called Dubliners. The Dead is the final story in, in this extraordinary collection that he wrote when he was a very young man. It's a very, very well-known story, and it's probably the most famous of the Dubliners' uh, stories. Um, it's been made into a film. It's been made, it was a, a musical version a few years back. It's had a couple of theatrical adaptations, but this is the first one that, was, that is immersive. So basically, you go to the American Irish Historical Society on 80th and 5th Avenue, and you arrive at the door, and you're escorted up to the parlor floor by the maid, um, Lily, who is a character in the story. Mm -hmm. And basically, you are guests of the Morkin family um, holiday dinner, which is on, I think it's January 6th. It's the Feast of the Epiphany. And, um, and you follow them, and you're with them, and, you, and they're in and out in between you. I arrive with my husband. I play Greta. My husband, Gabriel, is played by uh, Boyd Gaines. And basically, um, you're, you're part of our party, and then we, we really are very, very faithful to the book, to the, the novella. And uh, then at one point, we invite you in to have dinner, and then you have a fabulous meal, which I serve a lot of it to you. <laughs> Um, so I'm not only playing Greta, but I'm also serving a lot of food. And, uh, and then um, we have another little bit of the party that happens in the parlor floor. And then at one point, Gabriel and Greta, my character and Boyd's character, um, retire for the evening to have, uh, you know, we have a, the, kind of one of the most famous scenes in, in all of literature. And it, you follow us into the bedroom. And don't, don't worry, nothing terrifying happens. But, um, <laughs> but basically, it's just this beautiful, incredible piece. And that is sort of like the, an enormous exclamation point on the evening. Um, and you, know, you think it's like a party, and then it turns into this extremely brilliantly written um, sort of you know, you know, th thinking about what our lives are, who are we, what are our marriages about? And it's just, and I think it, it, there's something in it for everybody. That's what's so great about the show, is that if you love music, there's a ton of music, beautiful Irish music, beautiful classical music. And the whole evening is about an hour and 40 minutes with no intermission. So you come in and you, know, you leave and you've had a wonderful meal and you've seen some great, Great, hopefully great acting. Oh, absolutely. And some, you know, an excellent, the cast is extraordinary, beautiful combination of American and Irish actors. It's just been a thrilling experience, so I, I, I highly recommend it. But it's only 40, 42 people a night are our guests. That's it, that's the size of the audience. So it's a, a tough ticket. So the, it's, the show is running now until uh, till January 7th. Yes. And um, a lot of the performances are sold out because, as Kate mentioned, there are only 40, uh, about 40 seats for audience members. And it really doesn't feel like being part of an audience. It feels like being a guest at a party. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and because it, like you said, it, it only, it's an hour and 40 minutes, and it also includes this huge meal. When, you, when Lily huge. brings you up the stairs, the and first more thing alcohol. they do, they, give, they hand you Irish whiskey right. or some cider, if you right. prefer something non-alcoholic. And then there's wine with dinner, and there's a little aperitif after dinner. Yeah. Um, and I think that the word that I would use to describe the whole experience is just intimate. Mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole thing feels very intimate, and not just because we get to join you in the bedroom, <laughs> um, but because uh, it, it really... The, the, I, I, I've gone to a lot of immersive theater that has felt sort of like, ah, I'm sort of awkwardly standing in the mm -hmm. middle of something, mm -hmm. and how do I get out of the way? Sure. But this very seamlessly incorporated the audience mm -hmm. or the... 
guests at the party, I guess, uh, into the story of the play. Yeah, no, well, it's, it is very special. And, it, you know, I know for myself, even, even though I'm a, a professional actress, when I go to see shows on Broadway, off-Broadway, where there's audience participation, it's like, kill me now. I mean, I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> please don't pick me. Because I like to be on stage with my prescribed lines, and I like to know what I'm doing. But um, this is not one of those experiences. So you're never going to be asked to do anything that, you know, nobody's asked to do anything. There's one person who sits, we have four people who sit at the table with us every night. And then there's all these tables around us. And there's one person who might have a small interaction with one of the characters. But again, it's nothing, they don't have to do anything. It's just, I think it's very, my, my understanding from both you and many other people is it's just so surprising and wonderfully interesting um, the evening. And I, you know, I think that um, it's a very special, you will, you will not experience anything else like it in the theater. I wanted to just share a quick anecdote from my experience. I actually got to sit at the table with you and Boyd and a couple of the other actors. And, um, uh, and in addition to reciting your lines, you're also interacting with these strangers. Right. Um, I, uh, you know, I went a couple of days after Thanksgiving and my family is on the West Coast and I, I tend not to travel uh, all the way across the country for Thanksgiving. It's um, too short a trip. And, um, but, uh, so I didn't ha really have a Thanksgiving dinner this mm -hmm. year, but I went to have dinner with your family, <laughs> your, your yeah. the, the dead mm -hmm. 1904 family. And I, I was there kind of like, all right, I have to interact with people I don't know. And, but as soon as I cut into this beautiful piece of meat on, that was served to me on like <laughs> food gorgeous is really good, China, I started to cry. Oh. <laughs> I had such an emotional reaction to being in a room with a family and this incredibly festive atmosphere, and it was so loving. And certainly there's the, the conflict of the story, and the, but it felt like discourse. Mm -hmm. And... I didn't even realize that I had missed having a holiday meal, but here I was having a beautiful holiday meal. And I just, I felt like I was made so at home there. Um, it felt like exactly what I needed in a way I couldn't even have anticipated. So I want to thank you and the company You're welcome. Uh, for, for bringing <laughs> that to me. I'm curious as to how having different people at your table every night with whom to interact takes you out of that place of your prescribed lines like you would have in any other production, there's a little bit of improv built in there. There's quite a bit of improv at the table. We're there probably for about half an hour to 40 minutes with four, four people, and I personally deal with two people because we put two on one end and two at the other. And um, to be totally honest, um, not everybody stays in character, though we're faithful to the story, of course. But there's no need to, in truth. We kind of break character a little bit, and we ask where they're from, and you know, how did they come here? And we've had, you name it, every different kind of person sitting at our table. We've probably done now, um, we've done four, four dress rehearsals and about a week of previews. So we've, we've done a lot of performances now. And, um, uh, you know, it's it's been fascinating to get to know everybody and and also to find out like why everybody came to see the show. So what was it the impetus that made you want to come and see this show? So it was very sweet. But you know, it's like any great literature. You know, this is one of those universal stories. Like you say, you had a family, like a moment where you felt like you're, you know, you feel, oh my God, I'm sitting with a family having a festive meal, mm -hmm. and it's I'm not in California with my family. And you know, that's the thing about the great writers, um, and God knows James Joyce is one of them, that they just, it's something that everybody can relate to, no matter where you're from, no matter what culture you're from, what part of the country, what part of the world you're from. And that's what's so wonderful. And we've had literally like a United Nations of guests in the room and at our table, all, you know, all different parts of the world. And it's been, each one of them has really, I can tell, has had a very meaningful experience. I think that it's easy to get caught up in talking about the meal because that's sort of the sure. most grand part of the evening. But about a third of it takes place upstairs with you and Boyd mm -hmm. um, in your dressing gowns. Mm -hmm. And you have just, your character, Greta, has just had a an epiphany of sorts. Well, I guess Boyd is having an epiphany based on having witnessed Greta Fine. have an emotional experience. Exactly. Um, that is one of the most beautiful, touching, and 
haunting moments in New York mm -hmm. theater that I can remember, and I go to the theater a lot. Right. I wish that that room had more space. You know, I mean, it's the fact that it's so small mm -hmm. makes it so perfect. Yeah. But I wish that there was an well, opportunity for more people to experience that. Well, it got, and, it, and you know, it's interesting because it goes from like a larger space, you know, and it's just like when you go to different theaters and you see some, the, you know, some theaters have spaces that stick out into the audience where you're like on three quarters. So it's called a thrust. And then when you go to Broadway shows, mostly they're proscenium. So it's like a picture, you know, it's like a, a frame. And that all those kinds of experiences for actors are very different, for audiences are very different. But this is not even like in the, it's in the round, but it's like inside. I mean, there are times where the audiences are sort of scattered amongst us. And we've learned now how to navigate when they're standing in places that we're meant to be standing. We all, you know, we figure out other little places. But it's also what makes it so fresh and interesting. And both Boyd and I are going off to projects right after in a, in a real, you know, in real theaters, <laughs> um, in, pro, in, you know, conventional theaters, rather. And I said to him, it's going to feel weird, isn't it, to be like in a, a normal theater again? It's going to be feel like what's, you know, not as intimate or, you know, not as immediate. So, but it is... Um, it's a, it's a, it's one of those sh pieces of literature and one of those pieces of theater that will that stays with you, you know. And I know that for me, I had only ever read it, and then I saw the film, and then I saw a musical version, and I remember my experience of reading it when I was 16 years old and thinking, oh, I understand what he's talking about, and I felt so thrilled because I was reading James Joyce who wrote Ulysses, which is an incredibly amazing book, but is very huge and enormous. And this is something that is like a, it's like a little slice of heaven that is written by James Joyce. And all of the stories in Dubliners are amazing. So, you know, it's, it's incredibly accessible and very special. There's so many different directions I want to go based on what you just said. But I want to talk about the fact that you read this story at 16 and the memory that Greta is having that sets off this chain of events happened to her when she was about 16. That's right. And My God, I never Whether you're that. reading the story and connecting with it at that point uh, helps color your memory as Greta. Yeah, I, actually, in truth, I am more, more aware now of how different pieces of, of literature um, that I read when I was 16 years old how as I move through my life and I read them again at 30, at 40, at 50, and how I experience them, experience them differently. I feel that way about Shakespeare. I feel that way about Anton Chekhov, the great Russian playwright. Um, and I, I visited those pieces of work by those writers at many different points in my life, and it's sometimes the same one. And I think the biggest thing for me uh, that affects me about this particular um, story is that her memory, which she didn't even know was, it was like laid dormant. Mm -hmm. And it was a piece of music that makes her think about this boy that she knew who died when he was 17. And, you know, I have an 18 year old daughter. And I also have a 28 year old, but I think what it would, you know, Obviously, we all go to being parents and stuff and how we are affected by it. And so I, I'm, I think I think more about that than I do necessarily about having read it. But I do remember the experience of reading these stories when I was young and thinking, I understand these stories. And I, I love these stories. And I, 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 I could talk about these stories. And it, it's a very empowering thing when you're 15, 16 years old. Yeah. You know. You uh, have been in the public eye a lot. You play, How old were you when you played Alice in Wonderland on PBS? Uh, I was 26. Oh, okay. So yeah, you were, I was yeah, old. You were older. Um, <laughs> I was an old 20. <laughs> um, and then I know that you played a lot of the traditional ingenue. The, I did. The beautiful young girl with the round face, exactly. everybody's uh, friend. And, <laughs> um, and it wasn't often the leading role. Mm -hmm. And you made a transition into playing these very strong, you know, Hedda Gabler and, um, you know, and, and similar roles. Um, I heard you say once that um, it wasn't until you got into your 30s that you really found these meaty mm -hmm. roles. And I, I loved hearing that because I think so many people, especially just out of school, feel like they haven't landed yet, they haven't mm -hmm. found it yet, and l like time is running out. I love <laughs> that you have no. come into these mm -hmm strong, beautiful, and very visible roles mm -hmm. um, 
Well, the truth of it is, is that, you know, as an actor, you know, everybody thinks like, oh, you know, there's a plan afoot, you know, my agents or, you know, whoever the people are who are representing you, there's no plan. There's no plan. I mean, honestly, you just try to do the best work you can. You try to be in the right place at the right time. It's opportunity. It's luck. It's a lot of things. But I will tell you that when I, I went to the Yale School of Drama, which is an amazing school uh, for my MFA, and in my class at Yale were two other actresses who have also had extraordinary careers. One is Jane Kaczmarek, who played the mother, and Malcolm is the, in the middle. And the other is Frances McDormand, who won the um, Oscar for Fargo. And Fran and Jane and I all came out of Yale at the same time. We're all of a similar age. And it was all of us had our moments of sort of major success, sort of acting success around 39 or 40. And it happened at the same time for all of us. And we were very clear that that was so great that it happened then and not when we were 30 or in our 20s. Because in truth, we wouldn't have, we would have felt, felt like we had so much to live up to. Like, how can we ever accomplish beyond. And then it's really interesting what's happened in the sort of 20 years since then. We've all sort of done other projects, film, television. I started at the age of 46 was when I auditioned for Ellis Gray. And the truth of it is, I thought when they said to me, oh, there's this show, it's about doctors, and this is the mother of the leading lady, and she's got Alzheimer's. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, 40, I'm only 46 years old, and I'm already playing someone with Alzheimer's. It's like, holy moly, what's going to happen? And I thought, oh, this is, will be a nightmare. And I thought, I'll never see these people again. And then that's, and that's, and that's the thing about this business and you just never know what's going to happen. And who knew that day that I walked in and I met this wonderful African-American young woman who'd come out of USC called Shonda Rhimes, and she'd only done a movie. And it was like, who is she? This is her first show. And look what's happened. And so I feel so blessed. And one of the biggest excitements for me, I've lived in Los Angeles for 10 years. I'm from New York. Is that the work for women from the ages of 40 plus, and that means up to like 85 or 90, has gotten more interesting and more um, uh, exciting, and not just moms and grandmothers, which I, by the way, love playing also, <laughs> but, and I play a lot of them, but, but, and I am, you know, one of them, not grandma yet, <laughs> but um, can't wait for that, actually, to be honest. Um, and, you know, and that's the thing, is that's what's thrilling about the last 15 years in television, in cable, Theater has always had great roles for women, but now, you know, the media, the reason why Claire Danes does Homeland is because that is probably one of the greatest parts she's ever played. And by the way, what a performance. I mean, watching her, we, we, each, we watch each other for inspiration. And I watch her on Homeland and I go, oh my God, I'm so proud of her. And there's somebody else coming today, Bellamy Young, who plays Melly on Scandal, one of the greatest actresses I've ever worked with. She is an incredible actress and I can't, Always the few scenes that I have with her, I'm like, oh, I'm so excited I get to work with Melly, you know, with Bells, and she'll be here today. And so it's just, you know, we all feel very empowered by each other and by the, the women who are writing, the women who are directing. It's a very exciting time. I want to touch on the role that you played in bringing a strong woman to Broadway. Is it true that when you wanted to do Hedda Gabler, that you wanted that project to come to Broadway so much that you got on the phone with producers I and did. said, you have to do this? I did, and I don't, I've never done that before or since. Because Janet McTeer, who's here in Les Liaisons Dangereuses, she had done A Doll's House. And I saw A Doll's House and I said, oh, this can happen. It, Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen, who wrote both plays, had a gabbler in a doll's house. I said, this is a Broadway play. And when I did a, a sort of fledgling production of it, I said, I know this is a Broadway play. And I was right. I think that it's such a perfect and inspiring example of not following the rules exactly and saying, Don't this has to rules. happen. And if I have to do it myself, I'm going to do it myself. Exactly. And you did. And yeah. here you are. No, and the other thing, too, is, you know, um, you know, when we move in from, you know, you start to re develop relationships with people. I've worked in this business for 35 years. And, you know, so, sh you know, I've, I've obviously developed a relationship with Shonda. And then she writes Scandal. And then she writes the vice president, who's this, you know, conservative, very, you know, right wing woman. And she says, do you want to play it? And I go, yeah, of course. You know, and I mean, I never in my life, as you can probably tell, I'm not that person, thank God. But, you know, I never <laughs> thought I would play such a person. I've loved playing her. She's such a riot, you know, but so opposite from me. 
Can you talk about what's coming up next for you? I can. Um, I, I, you know, it's sort of not official, but who cares? Um, I um, give it I, to us. I'm, the very first play I did when I came out of Yale was Present Laughter by Noel Coward, and I that was 35 years ago, and now I'm about to do it again on Broadway with Kevin Klein starting in the spring. Yeah, I'm very excited. St. James Theater. Just saying. Uh, do you know when in the <laughs> spring this is going to happen? Uh, Mid March. Okay. Yeah, it's when we start performing. I'm putting it on my calendar yeah. now. I'm very excited. I'm so excited. And um, uh, just the fact that after having this very intimate experience, uh, seeing The Dead 1904, and then to know that that's not the last time I'm going to get to be in the same room with you yes. for a while. <laughs> and a lot um, of other people. Uh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a very different experience. But range yeah. is, yeah. The, I think, Yeah, I mean, from 42 to... people to like 700. Yeah. It's going to be, <laughs> yeah, it'll be like, oh, yes, now I, re I remember this. Oh, I can't wait. How do you feel about taking a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. Let's do it. Hi, Kate. Hi. Um, so I'm also really excited to see this. I think I'm going to go for my birthday in January. Oh, yay. So, um, so I just want to know, you know, your father's the late, great Richard Burton. Yeah. So I was just wondering, you know, growing up, did you take any techniques or tips from him as you started a career? Um, well, mostly my dad, Richard Burton, um, you know, a lot of you kids uh, would not know who he is because he's been gone for a very long time, but he was a seven-time Oscar nominee, one of the greatest Shakespearean actress of all time. And, um, you know, he... The, base, the biggest difference, I think, is that he kind of emerged fully formed and was, like, a huge, big star. I kind of took my time more, and because I went to drama school for three years, which he did not do... So I went to university, which was like big in my family. I was the first person to go to college, finish college, and then did my three years. So by the time I came out of Yale, I was in my mid-20s, and that was very purposeful. And, you know, but the thing that Dad always helped me with, because we did get to work together a few times, was just not, a, not having people push you into certain results when you were working that you needed to find your own way. And, you know, he was a very instinctive actor. He was incredibly smart, incredibly intelligent, incredibly well-read. And I knew that that was very important to be all those things in order to be a successful actor. So, um, but when I watch him now, it's so amazing. That's the incredible thing of having had an actor for a dad. And he was so well-known that there are so many things that I can watch of him, like his entire life from the age of 19 to, you know, 58 when he died. So, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable, but I, 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 I saw Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf the other day, and I was just, I couldn't, I mean, I just can't believe his performance. It's so unbelievable. It's an incredible performance. Have you felt like your kids have gotten to know him a little bit through the screen, or do you feel like that's a very different man than you knew at home? My kids, um, one is, my son is an actor, 28 years old, Morgan Ritchie, and my daughter Charlotte Ritchie is um, doing her gap time about a block from here <laughs> in the East Village um, after, after high school. And, uh, you know, both my kids have found their way to my dad separately and very differently. Um, my daughter was much more purposeful about watching a lot of his movies and really, you know, asking me a lot of questions. My son was, was a little different. He went about it a different way. But the weird thing is, is my son never met my father because he died before my son was born. But my son's an actor, and I've worked with him a number of times. And he does things that are exactly like my dad. And he never met him. So it's just that thing of genes. It's really unbelievable how it just, I, 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 I'm constantly taken aback by something that he will do on stage that I think, oh my God, my dad would have made that exact choice. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And we're not, you know, we're, we're all kind of, you know, like, oh my God, that's incredible. Moving on. You know, I mean, we just, it's just one of those things. But it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, it's, I was very lucky because I was the daughter, a Br an American daughter of a British actor. So I was able to have my own identity pretty much from day one. So that was great. And you were also a scholar of Russian literature, I scholar. heard. Yes, um, well, I mean, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I was planning to be a diplomat. I grew up in New York City, and I went to the United Nations School. So I thought oh, I would be in, in diplomacy. That's what I, but so I've ended up playing a lot of politicians. And that's about as far as it's gone. And doing a lot of other, you know, activist work. Um, I know you've said that one of your dream roles is Mrs. Lovett. 
in oh my Sweeney God. Todd. Really, you've really done your homework. Yeah, Madam. and yet I still managed to get your number of Tony nominations <laughs> wrong. But I got the deep, dark, the, like the hard stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I was just thinking um, present laughter. <laughs> um, I oh, I do know that maybe this is where I got the number five. You're one of five actresses to ever, or five performers to ever have been nominated for two Tonys in two categories in the same season. Amazing. That's where the five wow. came from. That's Figured true. it out. Um, <laughs> are there when? Okay, so. Sondheim, you love. Yeah, I love And him. you appeared, your last musical was Spring Awakening, the original production, is that correct? Correct, yes. I took over in it from right. um, Christine Estabrook. When are we next going to see you in something Sing? musical? Jesus God, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know, though, Mrs. Lovett, there was a sort of flirtation when Patti Lupone played Mrs. Mm -hmm. Lovett with Michael Cerveris. This is in Sweeney Todd, one of the greatest pieces of theater, theater you will ever see in your life. Um, I was asked if I would take over for her for like six weeks. And it, it was really intriguing, and I really thought about it for a long time. But then I thought, no, you know what? I have to have the full rehearsal. It's got to be six weeks. I've got to work with a vocal coach before I even arrive at rehearsal. Because when you do a musical, it's like a whole different ball of wax. I mean, it's so much more difficult. And also because it's complicated, and Sondheim is an actor's you know, composer. Uh, he writes for actors as opposed to singers. He likes actors who can sing as opposed to singers who can't act. <laughs> um, and he will always write for you. And that's why my experience with Boyd Gaines, by the way, who plays Gabriel Conroy. That's right. Did, you guys did company together. We did together. company together. He was the leading role of Bobby, and I was one of his best friends. And, you know, so that's, that, uh, that is something I would like to sing. My t There's very few roles that I think, oh, I must play, but that's one I really do think I really should have a go at that. Uh, you totally dodged the question of when we next get to hear you. <laughs> oh, sing. that I don't know. <laughs> I do sing a lot in the cabarets in Williamstown, Massachusetts, oh, yeah. so that's about it. But, um, but uh, you know, it, it's, I love to sing, I'm, you know, because I'm pure Welsh. I'm Celtic, but not Irish. I'm Welsh. And everybody in uh, Wales sings. We all sing. What's your favorite go-to song at the cabarets? You know, I sing a lot of um, I sing a lot of sort of um, Motown-ish kind of you know sort of rock, real rock and roll. I mean, I'm not I don't I'm not a show tune girl really. Uh -huh. I do some standards, you know, Chattanooga Choo Choo things like that. But I love Irish music too. Wonderful. We have time for one more question from the audience. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to know how the title relates to the actual story. You hear the title, The Dead, you would think it's something dark, but obviously that's not the case. So uh -huh. what's the uh, meaning behind the title? Hmm, Jean, Jean Corlitz. Uh, we have our, one of our co-adapters co is here. You know, that is a very interesting question. And you know what? It's something I think about every night because it comes up like the, it's very... It's very delicate the way it enters the story, and I'm speaking totally as an actress and not as any kind of literary person. But I know that it's addressed. It's addressed in the dinner scene. It, there's a beautiful song called The Dead, a beautiful song that is sung by one of our characters. And then Gabriel Conroy gives a beautiful speech where he talks about you know, our loved ones who are no longer with us. And for anybody who's lost somebody, and we all have, you know, it's a very powerful moment for me every night. And then basically, it, it, and then it's addressed again, because of course, Greta is thinking about this boy, Michael Fury, who died when he was 17. Um, and then, you know, when we go up to the, to the uh, bedroom scene, which, you know, is just sort of amazing, Gabriel, G Greta talks a lot about this boy and how it affect, you know, how he affected her. And, and his death affected her. And then Gabriel really gives one of the most beautiful speeches about how we, we, how we absorb and how we process death. And it, but again, it's done not in like a, like a punch in your mouth. It is just suddenly, it just flickers in. And mostly for me, being you know, my age at this point and dealing with loss and stuff, is that you just think it's a part of life. You know, it's really a part of life. And I think we all have to take it in and move on and think about our futures, but also think about our pasts. And that's how I experience it as an actress participating in the show every night. 
there's something about this production and the story, I think, that's, that feels, um, it reminds me of uh, Dickens, like A Christmas Carol. And, and whereas in A Christmas Carol, the ghosts are very present and they're actually humanized right. and they show up in, in right. human form um, in the dead, there are just as many ghosts, but they're more incorporated into the spirits of the living. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's more of a reflection on the impact mm -hmm. of the people who have come and gone, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and to be in the room, uh, to be in this beautiful townhouse that's been standing since, uh, since the, the 1800s. Oh, sure. Um, that is the home of the, the American Irish Historical Society. It, it did feel like those ghosts, both fictional and real, were there with us, not to haunt, but to engage and mm -hmm. to, to join us for the holiday meal. Well, it's also that, that, you know, the Irish in America is an incredible story, you know, how they came. And what, what one of the, the, the things that we've tried to highlight a little bit in our show is that, you know, they had to leave Ireland because of the potato famine. And they were forced to leave because they were all starving and dying. And you know, my husband is the grandson of an Irish woman, and and uh, you know, uh, who came over to Ellis Island and the whole did the whole thing. And it's just it's just such a powerful story about a group of incredibly vibrant people who had to leave their homeland. And so you know, it, it, there is a kind of wonderful juxtaposition because we're doing it in the American Irish Historical Society, which was created by Irish immigrants who came to the United States and wanted to have a place that was like their own. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, non, it's a nonstop kind of story of struggle and, you know, tr you know, journeys, which, you know, all great literature is. I think that we also need to mention that this is, this is a production of Irish Repertory Theater. Yes. And to find out more information, you can go to irishrep.com. A uh, lot of the tickets- Or the dead 1904. Or the dead 1904.com. Um, the, uh, there are not that many seats at this dinner mm -hmm. left, but there are some. I checked this, this morning. Mm -hmm. um, the show is running up on the Upper East Side in mm -hmm. this gorgeous townhouse. Seven shows a week. Uh, right, and you have to eat all those all meals, those even meals. several on this We worked day. it out. <laughs> there's a lot of salad that's eaten, not, not at those meals. The other thing, too, though, is that if there's a lottery and you can get cheaper tickets. That's right, um, through Today Ticks. From Today Ticks, there's ways to you know, um, to, to, to tr get, in, get in the door. So, and there's always, Today Ticks always has a, a couple of tickets, I think, for you. This show. is at the top of my list of recommendations of theater to see in New York. Um, it's both too bad that it's seasonal and also perfect that it is. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for bringing this production to life. Thanks to you. Uh, on behalf of the whole company, please pass my, I will. my thanks along. And um, it, it's been wonderful to spend this time with you today. Thank, thank you, you for being I'm here. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks, guys.